Number 18, Robin Leah Gentile. When a 23-year-old substitute teacher from Las Vegas found out that her fiancé had supposedly been texting other women in 2015, she attempted to turn the tables by kissing one of her students. According to an arrest report, Robin Leah Gentile and the victim locked lips five times and exchanged more than 800 text messages over a month-long period. The inappropriate activity allegedly took place in Gentile's car and outside the student's residence during the twice-weekly rides home that Gentile provided. The student told investigators that he felt obligated to carry on the relationship in order to avoid an uncomfortable environment at the extracurricular program that Gentile ran. During police questions, Questioning, Gentile reportedly admitted that it made her feel powerful to go behind her husband's back. She said she didn't see the victim as a student and claimed that he was romantic toward her during their text conversations. Gentile was found guilty and was sentenced to probation along with up to four years of suspended prison time. She was also ordered to undergo counseling and pay all fines and fees imposed by the court. Number 17. Veronica Youngblood in a sickening and unforgivable act of violence that was carried out in August 2018, a mother of two named Veronica Youngblood killed her kids as part of a twisted revenge plot against her ex-husband. The unspeakable tragedy occurred at the apartment Veronica shared with her daughters in McLean, Virginia. One of the victims survived long enough to dial 911 and explain what happened while Veronica called her ex-husband, Ron Youngblood, and boasted about what she had just done. Veronica confessed to the double homicide just hours later and was charged in connection with the crime. She told investigators that she believed she deserved the death penalty, indicating that she understood the wrongfulness of her actions. During a two-week trial, prosecutors described Veronica as spiteful, selfish, vengeful, and calculated. They accused her of committing the murders as a message to her ex, Ron, who was planning to move out of state with one of their daughters just two days after the killings. The defense argued that their client was hearing voices at the time of the murders, and that she was therefore not guilty by reason of insanity. Veronica's attorneys also blamed her actions on her poor upbringing and the abuse she allegedly suffered at the hands of family members and her ex-husband. The state maintained that a difficult past is no excuse for murdering someone and that Veronica's actions were both planned and deliberate. Her premeditation was evident in her purchase of a gun just nine days before the killings and when she gave sleep aid gummies to the victims so they would be asleep when she shot them. In 2023, a jury found Veronica guilty of two counts of first-degree murder and imposed a 78-year sentence despite prosecutors urging for a life term. Records list her release date as 2086, which means that she will most likely spend the rest of her life behind bars. If she lives long enough to see freedom again, she'll be almost 100 years old when she's released. Number 16. Isaac Garcia and Roland Barber a parking dispute between neighbors in Long Beach, California turned deadly in June of 2023 when 40-year-old Roland Barber allegedly shot 35-year-old David Navarez. According to investigators, the men didn't know each other before they crossed paths that night. Barber was upset about people blocking his parking spaces, sparking a heated fight between him and Navarez that ended in gunfire. As Navarez lay on the ground dying from multiple gunshot wounds, Barber fled the scene. Barber managed to evade law enforcement for the next two weeks until someone shot at him and his wife outside their condominium complex in an attempt to get revenge for killing Navarez. He was hit in the arm by one of the bullets and was finally apprehended later that day. Authorities charged Barber with murder, assault with a deadly weapon, shooting at an inhabited dwelling, and being a felon in possession of a firearm. His case appears to be ongoing. The suspect in the second shooting, 29-year-old Isaac Garcia, fled the scene but was captured a short while later. He faces charges of attempted murder, assault with a firearm, shooting at an inhabited dwelling or occupied vehicle, and being a felon in possession of a gun. In September 2023, Garcia pleaded no contest to attempted murder in exchange for all the other charges being dropped and was sentenced to 14 years in prison. Number 15. Priestly Poison 
Father Felice Palomara is perhaps Italy's most vocal priest against organized crime. He's known for openly denouncing mob-like syndicates, including the Nadrangheta, which is believed to be the world's wealthiest organized crime group. Given the power of these organizations, it's no surprise that Palomara has received death threats for his outspokenness. And someone tried to act on these threats in early 2024, when a mafia hitman poisoned the holy water and wine that were being used for a Saturday mass in the southern region of Calabria. As he presided over the service, Palomara noticed a bleach-like smell coming from the wine and water. He immediately stopped the mass and called the national police, known as the Carabinieri. Authorities determined that the liquids had been poisoned with bleach, just as the priest had suspected. It was only natural for Palomara to assume that members of the Nadrangheta were behind the act, and that the poisoning was carried out as retribution for his vocal stance against organized crime. Speaking with the Corriere della Sera newspaper, Palomara said he had been at the church for a decade and that he had good relationships with his parishioners, making it unlikely that any members of the church were involved in the apparent attempt on his life. In addition to receiving death threats, Palomara's car has been vandalized on at least two occasions. The mob has an extremely powerful presence in the region and in the town more specifically, where the local council was dissolved in 2023 due to fears that the mafia had infiltrated its ranks. Despite the dangers that come along with living in a stronghold for the very group he criticizes, Palomara is dedicated to maintaining his stance against organized crime. Number 14. Serena Wolf Staff members at the Clear Sky Cafe in Clearwater Beach, Florida probably thought it was their lucky day when a young woman left a $5,000 tip on a $55 tab in July 2019. The generous gratuity meant a lot to the waitress, who had recently put her dog down. But 24-year-old Serena Wolf wasn't simply a kind-hearted patron who wanted to pay it forward like the majority of people who leave huge tips on restaurant bills. She was allegedly drunk and angry at her boyfriend when she paid the enormous check with his credit card. The boyfriend, Michael Crane, told police that Wolf was upset and trying to get back at him for refusing to buy her a plane ticket home to Buffalo, New York. He said that Wolf had denied making the charge, which was refunded back to his card. By then, the restaurant had already paid the waitress, and it's unclear whether or not she was able to keep the money. Wolf was booked into the Pinellas County Jail on one count of grand theft, and it certainly wasn't her first time landing in police custody. Two years earlier, in 2017, she was accused of stealing a man's wallet outside a bar in Tonawanda, New York. She denied stealing the wallet, even though over $500 cash was found stashed in her underwear. The wallet was found behind a nearby dumpster, and Wolf was arrested on multiple larceny charges. Wolf was sentenced in absentia to prison time in 2020 for stealing a credit card, but she skipped several court dates and wasn't present at the hearing. It might have been a good idea to detain the young woman pending the outcome of the case, but this wasn't an option due to New York State's generous bail reform policies, which only allow judges to detain defendants who are accused of violent crimes. Wolf eventually materialized and was taken into custody to serve her time. She appealed the case, but the court stood by its original guilty ruling and convicted her of fourth-degree grand larceny. According to state prison records, she's due to be released in August 2024. Number 13. Dewey Frederick in a destructive act of retribution that was captured on camera in July of 2022, an elderly man named Dewey Frederick set fire to a used car lot in Fort Wayne, Indiana, over a nearly 40-year grudge he had held against the business. 79-year-old Dewey Frederick was still seething over a Jeep he had bought from the business back in 1986, which he believed had a faulty motor. To achieve his version of justice, he entered the lot at around 1.30 in the morning and inserted a burning road flare into the fuel tank of a jeep. Within moments, the vehicle was engulfed in flames. Frederick drove off as the fire spread to two other vehicles, causing nearly $43,000 worth of damage. He then drove to a separate car lot owned by the same dealer and dropped a lit road flare into a convertible, causing an additional $13,000 in damages. The dealership owner posted surveillance footage of the crimes on social media, and Frederick was soon identified as the prime suspect in the case. He was arrested on suspicion of four counts of arson, resulting in losses of over $5,000, and could have faced up to 48 years in prison. 
Frederick pleaded guilty as charged and was ordered to serve time at a corrections-run residential facility while wearing an ankle monitor. Just a month later, he tried to destroy the battery pack from his ankle monitor by microwaving it, causing sparks to fly and a small fire to break out. The convicted arsonist was also accused of throwing his ankle monitor against a wall in an attempt to destroy it. He was charged with felony arson, violating a home detention order, and violating probation. During questioning, Frederick reportedly told police he would have done anything to escape the residence where he was living. His probation for the previous arson case was revoked, and he was sentenced to 15 years for the probation violation. He's required to serve three years of his sentence in a community corrections center, and will spend the remaining 12 years on probation, as long as he's able to avoid any further legal trouble. Number 12. Keith Agee 18-year-old Brooklyn Sims was gunned down in cold blood while working at a Home Depot store in Pensacola, Florida in August 2023. Investigators identified the shooter as 20-year-old Keith Agee, the father of the victim's child. The relationship between Sims and Agee did not end on the friendliest of terms. Sims had obtained an order of protection against Agee, but it was difficult to follow because they had a young child in common, which required them to communicate with one another. The former couple's irreconcilable differences tipped over into a motive for murder when Agee became convinced that Sims had given him an STD. This would eventually prove not to be true, but Agee's mind was made up. He entered the store, confronted Sims, shot her several times in front front of witnesses, and then fled in his car, tossing the gun out of the window during his getaway drive. On the day of Brooklyn's murder, Agee exchanged text messages with his mother, 50-year-old Sheila Agee, who was working at the same Home Depot store as the victim. Sheila provided her son with the store's address and was aware of the murder ahead of time, but did nothing to try stopping it. Instead, she sent Agee a message saying, as long as you don't shoot me. Agee turned himself into law enforcement later that day. During his trial, he admitted to shooting Sims in a fit of uncontrollable rage when she refused to listen to his accusations about giving him an STD. As the young woman walked away with her head held high, Agee pulled his gun from his waistband and pumped seven bullets into her body, giving her absolutely no chance of defending herself or escaping. Although Agee pulled the trigger, authorities charged both him and his mother with first-degree murder. In late 2023, Keith was convicted of the charge and sentenced to life without parole. As of February 2024, Sheila's case is still awaiting trial. Number 11. Sheila Padilla Shortly before 4 a.m. one morning in August 2023, an armed suspect leaned out of a Cadillac and fired multiple shots at a home in Roswell, New Mexico as the vehicle drove past. At least one of the bullets struck 45-year-old Christopher Herrera, killing him at the scene as the Cadillac sped off into the darkness. Investigators identified the suspected shooter as 37-year-old Sheila Padilla. 33-year-old Matthew Villarreal is accused of driving the car, and 37-year-old Michael Kirby was was also named as a defendant in the case. According to authorities, the drive-by was carried out in retaliation for another shooting earlier that night, which left a friend of the suspect wounded. Sadly, Herrera was not connected to the previous incident, and prosecutors believe he was killed in a case of mistaken identity. All three suspects are charged with first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit first-degree murder, and conspiracy to commit shooting at or from a motor vehicle, while Padilla faces an additional charge of actually shooting from the car. Their cases are ongoing. Number 10. Elgin Wilson a middle-aged mother of five named Shirley Coleman was mercilessly gunned down on a Wilmington, Delaware street in October 2018, just one day after her 47th birthday. She was shot at least six times in the deadly attack. Investigators identified a teenager named Elgin Wilson as their prime suspect, but they didn't nab him for Coleman's murder until five days later, when he was arrested in an unrelated drug case. During a search of two phones that were found in Wilson's possession, detectives Detectives found evidence linking him to the shooting, including location data that allegedly placed him at the crime scene. The suspect was further linked to the homicide via surveillance footage of a Buick Lucerne that was seen both near the crime scene and at Wilson's home. At least one witness told law enforcement that Wilson shot Coleman as an act of revenge against her son, Antonio Russell, who's currently serving a 15-year prison sentence for killing Wilson's brother, Hamier Harris. 
The suspect was charged with first-degree murder, criminal contempt, possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony, and three counts of being a prohibited person in possession of a firearm. In 2022, nearly four years after Coleman's death, Wilson pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and a conspiracy charge. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison, followed by five years of probation. Describing the murder as a tragic reminder of the all-too-common vicious cycle of violence begetting violence, Attorney General Kathleen Jen cited the outcome of the case as an example of how senseless gun violence will not be tolerated in Delaware. Number 9. Dijuan Clark Even after being shot in the leg three times in 2014, Dijuan Clark wanted to set an example that encouraged others not to resort to gun violence. At the time, there was an intense feud going on between his family and another household in their Alexandria, Virginia neighborhood. Clark told his loved ones not to retaliate against the person who shot him, and he also urged them not to take the law into their own hands after his brother Pierre was killed in 2016. Yet just a month after Pierre's death, Clark fatally shot his brother's suspected killer, 23-year-old Sequan Turk Hall. According to prosecutors, the killer shot Hall in the back as he tried to run away, and then fired a bullet into his head as he lay dying on the ground. In March 2017, Clark pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to 31 years in prison. At his sentencing hearing, he said he was not proud of his actions and that he was aware that nothing he said could bring back the victims who had died as a result of the long-standing neighborly dispute. Number 8. Jeremy Jacobs Accepting criticism can be difficult, but a massage therapist from Maple Ridge, British Columbia took his anger over a negative review so far that he destroyed his own career. Jeremy Jacobs was allegedly so enraged when a woman left dissatisfied feedback about him online in 2020 that he launched an all-out campaign to ruin her life. The patient had accused him of being needlessly aggressive toward her about wearing a COVID mask, which wasn't required at the time of her appointment. She never received the treatment she came for and shared her opinion of the experience in a Google review. In retaliation for the woman's harsh words, Jacobs attempted to tarnish the woman's good standing as a dental hygienist by contacting her professional college and accusing her of fraud and gender-based harassment. He was also accused of falsely reporting the woman to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police for alleged hate crimes and contacting her employer with allegations that she suffered from mental issues. The woman was ultimately cleared of any wrongdoing, but the false accusations severely disrupted her life. Her mental health especially suffered as she underwent the humiliating experience of having her sanity and integrity intensely scrutinized. When Jacobs's various complaints failed to impose any long-term suffering on the woman's life, he allegedly began harassing the people who investigated his reports. He insisted he was the true victim, claiming that the woman had launched a vendetta against him and his family. But the disgruntled masseuse's behavior had become so volatile by then that the situation spoke for itself. Jacobs was even more infuriated when the College of Massage Therapists of BC launched an investigation into his bogus complaints against the victim. In 2023, a panel ruled that he had committed misconduct by filing the reports and by harassing the investigators who concluded that the allegations against the woman were untrue. In addition to relinquishing his massage therapy license, Jacobs was ordered to pay $12,000 in fines and costs. If he decides to return to his profession, he'll face a 10-month suspension before he can go back to work. In an email to CBC News following the panel's decision, Jacobs claimed to be a victim of anti-male bias. He accused those involved in his case of violating his human rights and publicly shaming him. And while the panel determined that Jacobs had no factual or logical basis for his complaints against the victim, he insisted that he truly believed she was a danger to the public. The former masseuse said that he planned to start a petition to overturn the disciplinary findings, but it's unclear whether these efforts are underway. For now, the panel's findings stand, and it's probably safe to say that Jacobs acted out of a desire for revenge rather than a genuine concern for society's safety. Number 7. Destiny Hendricks and Gregory Powell 
A 32-year-old San Antonio woman was about to leave for work on Valentine's Day morning in 2023 when a gun-wielding man in a ski mask ambushed her outside her apartment building. The suspect forced the woman into an SUV at gunpoint, then took her phone and went through it while a female suspect drove. At the same time, the victim's boyfriend began receiving text messages from the woman's phone, stating that she wanted to break up with him. At one point during the drive, the SUV stopped abruptly. The driver proceeded to inject the victim with a syringe filled with what she suspected was insulin before getting back behind the wheel and driving to a Super 8 motel. Inside one of the rooms, the abductors bound the woman to a chair with duct tape and tortured her. Police would later identify the suspects as 32-year-old Destiny Hendricks and 33-year-old Gregory Powell. According to an arrest affidavit, Hendricks left the room after a certain length of time, leaving the victim alone with Powell. The torment continued as Powell allegedly threatened the woman with a gun in a Russian roulette-like fashion. An opportunity to escape came when the victim realized that her feet had been bound over her socks, enabling her to free herself and run while Powell was in the restroom. While reviewing surveillance footage of the kidnapping with investigators, the victim's boyfriend recognized Hendricks as his ex-girlfriend and said that she had been harassing him and his girlfriend for months. During questioning, Hendricks reportedly admitted to the abduction and said she wanted the victim dead. She blamed the victim for ruining her relationship with the man that the victim was now dating. Authorities charged Hendricks with one count of aggravated kidnapping, while Powell was hit with one count each of aggravated assault, aggravated kidnapping, and aggravated robbery. Records show that the defendants are not currently in state prison or county lockup, leaving the outcome of the case unclear. Number 6. Raul Alexander Cuevas Two people are dead and a young man's future is ruined after one murder led to another in the Nampa, Idaho region in March 2023. The tragic series of events began with the fatal stabbing of 52-year-old Michelle E. Luna at her residence, where she succumbed to her injuries despite emergency responders' best efforts to save her. Early the next morning, police responded to a reported murder at a gas station roughly 25 miles from where Luna was killed. Officers arrived to find Michelle's suspected killer, Jesus Ararutia, unresponsive and slumped over the steering wheel of his car. The 39-year-old had been stabbed to death in what investigators quickly came to believe was a revenge killing for taking Luna's life. Detectives naturally turned their attention toward Luna's 31-year-old son, Raul Alexander Cuevas, as Urrutia's suspected killer. He was picked up by law enforcement at a gas station roughly 20 miles from where Urrutia was killed and is now facing a first-degree murder charge in connection with the case. On the one hand, it's hard to fault Cuevas for wanting revenge against his mom's killer, but the law doesn't allow for this type of eye-for-an-eye justice, and he now faces a potential lifetime in prison as a consequence for taking the law into his own hands. Number 5. Frederick Banks after spending a decade in federal prison and completing probation in August 2015, 47-year-old serial fraudster Frederick Banks was truly free for the first time in many years. But instead of celebrating the beginning of this new chapter in his life, the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania resident clung stubbornly to a grudge he held against the FBI agents who investigated his case. Shortly after his release, Banks allegedly posted over two dozen personal ads on Craigslist posing as one of the agents and listing their personal information, including their phone number and address. The ad reportedly stated that the agent and his wife were seeking a third person to join them for a casual encounter. Banks was also accused of making several harassing phone calls to the agent prior to his arrest on a federal interstate stalking charge. In 2015, he was federally charged with interstate stalking. More charges were added to the case the following year, including wire fraud, aggravated identity theft, making false statements, and another interstate stalking count. The case proceeded to inch its way through the court system for several years, as Banks filed one frivolous motion after another in an apparent attempt to defeat the allegations he faced. Finally, in 2019, a jury found him guilty of wire fraud and aggravated identity theft. Banks was sentenced to nearly nine years in federal prison and has continued to fight his case from behind bars ever since by appealing his conviction, trying to get his sentence reduced, and repeatedly applying for compassionate release. Inundating the court with more paperwork than it can reasonably keep up with appears to be his tried and true way of punishing the system, even though all it has really done is delay his court hearings and drag his cases out for far longer than necessary. 
number four, Titiana Coppage. In the year following the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, gun violence in Kansas City, Missouri spiked to an alarming level. A teenager named Jason Ugwa Jr. became a casualty of the rising crime rate in January 2021 when he was shot while walking home from a gas station with two friends. Agua's friends carried him home and called the police, but emergency responders were unable to resuscitate the young man. Agua's 21-year-old sister, Titiana Coppage, was deeply affected by her younger brother's death. Three days after the shooting, she allegedly tracked the car she believed was involved in Agua's murder to a parking lot, where she allegedly shot her cousin, 36-year-old Keith Lars, in the chest and leg. Witnesses later told police that they saw a man placing the dying victim into the car and driving it to a nearby intersection, where Lars was found dead. Investigators were quick to zero in on Coppage, who allegedly admitted to the crime in a text message to a relative. She was also accused of taking credit for the fatal shooting in a text message to her deceased brother. Following an investigation, Coppage was arrested on suspicion of second-degree murder. She claimed that she acted in self-defense and that Lars had fired at her first. The young woman eventually pleaded guilty to a reduced voluntary manslaughter charge and was sentenced to 15 years in prison. In addition to reflecting the growing problem of gun violence in Kansas City, the killing highlighted the dire need for more support and resources for families who are affected by gun violence. Mayor Quinton Lucas made it clear in a social media post that not enough is being done to stop and prevent shootings or the needless deaths that they come with. Number 3. Orlando Tercero During her time as a nursing student at Binghamton University in New York State, Haley Anderson decided that she didn't want to be tied down with a serious relationship while she finished her education and established a career. In 2017, she broke up with her boyfriend, Kevin Acampo, and the two continued to see each other casually. That same year, Haley also began casually seeing a fellow nursing student from Nicaragua named Orlando Tercero. She made it clear to both men that she wanted no strings attached, and in a perfect world, her honesty would have perhaps been enough to prevent her lovers from catching serious feelings. But it's not a perfect world, and it wasn't long before Tercero started acting jealous and possessive. He wanted Haley all to himself and couldn't stand that she was seeing other people. At one point, Tercero's behavior became so controlling that Haley decided to hit the brakes on their fling. After knowing full well that she wasn't interested in a committed relationship, Tercero had smothered her anyway, leading her to believe that they needed some time apart, at the very least. Shortly into this cooling-off period, Tercero slashed all four of the tires on Haley's car. Knowing that a criminal record could threaten his nursing career, Haley declined to press charges. Tercero reimbursed her for the cost of replacing the tires, and because Haley wasn't one to dwell on the negative, she considered it a closed matter, even though her friends were growing increasingly worried about Tercero's behavior. When Haley failed to return home and went radio silent in March 2018, her concerned roommates tracked her phone's location to Tercero's apartment. They went to the residence and climbed in through a window, not expecting the horror scene that followed when they entered Tercero's bedroom. Haley's body was in the bed and was clearly dead. Based on the evidence at the scene, it appeared as though Haley had been beaten and strangled to death. Investigators surmised that she had entered the house voluntarily and was most likely attacked in her sleep. By the time Haley's body was discovered, Tercero had fled to Nicaragua, causing the young woman's loved ones to fear that justice would never be served. But he was found fairly quickly thanks to the widespread news coverage the case received, and American officials began making plans to extradite him to the US. They ran into an unexpected hurdle upon discovering that Tercero was a dual citizen, which gave Nicaragua the options of extraditing him for trial in the US or keeping him in the country and trying the case there. The decision was made to hold the trial in Nicaragua, causing panic among Haley's loved ones who were unfamiliar with the country's justice system and unsure of what to expect. Tercero was formally charged with femicide, which is defined as the murder of a woman due to her gender. Prosecutors accused him of killing Haley in a jealous fit and as a punishment for refusing to see him while she dated other men. He was found guilty in 2019 and sentenced to 30 years in prison, much to the relief of Haley's friends and family. After he serves his time in Nicaragua, U.S. officials will revisit the case and determine whether to try Tercero in America on a second-degree murder charge that he has yet to face. 
Number two, Natasha Atkinson. All hell broke loose outside an apartment building in Artesia, New Mexico in May of 2020, when a woman was accused of slashing the tires on her ex-boyfriend's father's car and lunging at the victim with a knife. Police responded to the residence shortly before midnight and spoke with the victim, who said that 38-year-old Natasha Atkinson had been harassing him ever since his son broke up with her six months earlier. Atkinson pointed the finger right back at the victim, claiming that he had slashed her tires. She admitted to throwing beer on the man's car, but denied being behind the tire slashing. A witness told responding officers that they had seen Atkinson committing the crime, and she was arrested on suspicion of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and injuring or tampering with a motor vehicle. Current records show that she is not in state custody, indicating that she was most likely spared from any severe consequences. The outcome of the case is unclear. We have another great video lined up right after number one. If you need more of a daily world list dosage, then be sure to stay tuned if you haven't seen that one yet. Number one, Gregory Cunningham Jr. Florida resident Gregory Cunningham Jr. was just a kid in 2011 when his 26-year-old cousin Michael Smith was shot dead during a botched drug deal in Lauderdale Lakes. The killer, Joaquin Ham, served just six years in prison for third-degree murder. Cunningham never forgot about his cousin's violent death or Ham's seemingly lenient punishment. Shortly after his release in 2020, Ham was mercilessly gunned down in the street. Investigators identified Cunningham as their prime suspect based on phone location data and text messages he exchanged shortly after the shooting. In one message he allegedly wrote, shots hit him in his temple, watch his head explode. Other messages and handwritten notes pointed toward the likelihood that Cunningham killed Ham as retribution for his cousin Michael's death nine years earlier. He was captured in Georgia four months after Ham's death and was charged with murder alongside an accomplice, Brian Dean. The case finally went to trial in September 2023, but the outcome has yet to be revealed to the public. Number 13. A Double Dose of Revenge Porn most revenge porn crimes are committed electronically, but one Louisiana woman allegedly decided to go the old-fashioned route in 2020 by mailing intimate photos of two individuals to over two dozen people. According to the Calcasieu Parish Sheriff's Office, 32-year-old Sarah D. Faris of Sulphur had access to one of the victim's personal information. She was accused of sending degrading letters about the man to at least 30 people, along with copies of his nude photos and traveling to Texas to mail the letters. Sheriff's Deputy Stitch Gallery told local station Fox 29 that the victim was contacted by multiple people about the letters. The man realized that Faris had access to his social media account because she had helped him set it up years earlier. After learning about Faris's alleged revenge plot, authorities charged her with 150 counts of non-consensual disclosure of a private image. She was released on a $75,000 bond later that day, but soon ended up back in custody on even more charges. Just weeks after her first arrest, Farris was accused of including photos of not one, but two victims in the perverted pamphlets that she sent in the mail. She was charged with another 30 counts of non-consensual disclosure of a private image. Farris was freed on a $15,000 bond and scheduled to return to court at a later date. The outcome of the case is unclear. Number 12. Hilda Nordhoek 27-year-old Robert Miller arrived at his Wichita, Kansas home one day in 2018 to find a screen door ripped off its hinges, a smashed mailbox, and a window that had been shattered by a brick. Inside, he found his beloved dog beaten to death. Police initially failed to identify a suspect, but continued to investigate the case. In the meantime, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, better known as PETA, offered a $5,000 reward for information leading to the identification and arrest of the person responsible. Miller was devastated by the loss of his 10-year-old American Bulldog, who he called Buffalo Boy. Nearly a year later, in early 2019, police charged 30-year-old Hilda Nordhoek in connection with the crime after identifying her through surveillance footage and a license plate reader program. Prosecutors claimed that the woman had a romantic past with Miller and accused her of killing his dog in a jealous rage. In 2021, Nordhoek pleaded no contest to animal cruelty, theft and burglary and was sentenced to 30 days in jail plus two years of probation. 
While handing down the sentence, the judge issued a stern warning that if she violated the terms of her probation, she would automatically be required to serve 13 months in prison for burglary, plus 12 months in county lockup for animal cruelty. Number 11. Candice Nicole Jones and Edward Brannan Barry Ten days after 34-year-old mother of two Emily Hacker vanished in early 2017, her body was found in a shallow grave in rural Burleson County, Texas. The contents of the burial were burned in an apparent attempt to destroy evidence, but the medical examiner was able to conclude that the young woman died from blunt force injuries. Investigators quickly discovered that Hacker had been recently pulled over by the police for a routine traffic stop. While searching her vehicle, officers found a gun. Hacker told the cops that the weapon wasn't hers and that it belonged to 32-year-old Candace Nicole Jones of Rockdale. Detectives theorized that Jones murdered Hacker for ratting her out to the police. She and four other suspects, including 32-year-old Edward Brannan Barry, were arrested in connection with Hacker's death. Jones and Barry were each charged with one count of capital murder. Jones and Brannan both pleaded guilty and were sentenced to 50 years in prison. As part of their plea agreements, they waived their right to appeal their cases. According to records, they will both become eligible for parole in 2042, and their latest release date is in 2067. Number 10. Yasmin Walker a very unfortunate British man was enjoying a movie at the cinema one day in 2021 when he began receiving text messages informing him that his nude photo had been posted on social media. His ex-girlfriend, 30-year-old Yasmin Walker, had shared the intimate snapshot with her 1,300 followers, along with a sarcastic comment asking, what the bleep is that, followed by a laughing emoji. The victim begged Walker to delete the post. She finally complied when the man threatened to call the police, but by then, the damage was done. Authorities charged Walker with disclosing a private photo with the intent to cause distress. Walker claimed that she posted the photo by accident and blamed her poor vision for clicking the wrong button. During her trial, her attorney argued that his client suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder stemming from multiple abusive relationships, although none of those relationships were with the victim in the revenge porn case. In fact, Walker claimed that her vision was bad because of injuries that an ex-boyfriend caused during an attack. The defendant's lawyer also told the court that Walker suffered from a nearly decade-long marijuana habit and that she was trying to kick the habit for good. While the judge took these factors into consideration, he also thought that it was important to sentence Walker appropriately for her actions and to set an example by imposing a punishment that showed that this type of crime will not be tolerated. Walker received a three-month reduced prison sentence in what the judge described as a short, sharp shock so that people know revenge pornography means prison. Number 9. Kanisha Rice and Sheldon Johnson 39-year-old Kenyana Edwards made the fateful decision to drive drunk after leaving a nightclub in early 2023. She drove the wrong way along a Las Vegas highway and collided with another car at 2.30 in the morning. Edwards and the other driver both died at the scene. A toxicology test later revealed that Edwards' blood alcohol level was more than three times the legal limit when she got behind the wheel, and she also had cocaine and marijuana in her system. Tragedy struck again the very next day when Edward's boyfriend, 35-year-old Martin Loftus, was found dead in his apartment with multiple gunshot wounds. Evidence at the scene suggested that the shooter had followed Loftus down a hallway as he tried to run into a bedroom to hide. Based on witnesses' description of a vehicle that was seen leaving the apartment complex, along with other pieces of evidence, investigators identified the suspected killers as Kenyana Edwards' brother, 34-year-old Sheldon Johnson, and his girlfriend, 36-year-old Kenesha Rice. According to police, Johnson had made posts on social media implying that he blamed Loftus for his sister's death. He also allegedly alluded to his plans to murder Loftus as revenge for Edward's death. Johnson and Rice were arrested in California and extradited to Las Vegas, where they each faced charges of open murder, conspiracy to commit murder, burglary, and conspiracy to commit burglary. 
Number 8. David Crawford Investigators in six counties across Maryland spent two decades trying to solve a string of nearly a dozen arsons that started during the early 2000s and resulted in multiple families losing their homes and or vehicles. Several of the fires were set when the victims were asleep in the middle of the night. Miraculously, all of the families who were targeted in the years-long crime spree managed to escape the flames without physical injury. Law enforcement wasn't even sure if all the crimes were connected until 2020 when they discovered evidence in the aftermath of yet another arson that finally led them to a suspect. The victims had a history of disagreements with former Laurel Police Chief David Crawford, who had retired back in 2010. A closer look into previous cases revealed even more connections between Crawford and past victims, who all had a history of issues with the former top cop. The targets included former colleagues, a chiropractor, and even Crawford's stepson. Evidence at the crime scenes showed a repeated pattern of the culprit using gasoline as an accelerant, and at least one of the crimes was captured on home surveillance footage. During a search of Crawford's home in 2021, investigators found evidence further connecting him to the crimes, including a list of targets. And while they were able to connect Crawford to the crime using forensic evidence, his grudges against the victims proved to be the big break in the case that led to the rest of the discoveries pointing toward his possible guilt. The accused serial arsonist was finally arrested in March of 2021. He was charged with 58 counts in four different counties, including Prince George's County, Montgomery County, Frederick County, and Howard County. Following a month-long trial in early 2023, a Howard County judge convicted Crawford of eight counts of attempted first-degree murder, three counts of arson, and one count of malicious burning in connection with three separate arsons. He received eight life sentences, six of which are to be served concurrently, plus 75 years behind bars. As long as the conviction and sentence stand, the 71-year-old will never be released from prison. Crawford has maintained his innocence throughout the case and continues to do so as he awaits trial in various other counties. He plans to appeal his conviction despite facing at least four more attempted murder charges and at least three counts of first-degree arson. Number 7. Michael Keatley A group of six men were playing cards and drinking beer outside a home in Ruskin, Florida on Thanksgiving Day in 2010 when a minivan pulled up to the property. Armed with a shotgun and wearing a shirt that said Sheriff on it, the driver exited the vehicle and told the men he was looking for someone who went by the nickname Creeper. The group knew Creeper, but he wasn't at the gathering. Suddenly, the armed visitor ordered everyone to the ground. Believing that he was a real cop, the friends followed the man's orders. But he wasn't a police officer, and he proceeded to shoot the men one by one, killing 28-year-old Juan Gutron and his 22-year-old brother, Sergio Gutron. The other four victims survived their injuries. Police were initially at a loss to identify the suspect, who fled the scene before law enforcement arrived. A few days after the shooting, an informant told investigators that a local ice cream man, Michael Keatley, had recently been talking about his plans to get revenge on a pair of thieves who had robbed and opened fire on him 11 months earlier. The masked gunman shot Keatley five times, leaving him permanently disabled, and made off with $12 that they stole from his truck. Keatley had mistakenly suspected Creeper of being one of the thieves, when in reality none of his six victims had anything to do with the robbery. As it turned out, they were targeted in a disturbing case of mistaken identity. Authorities arrested Keatley several days after the crime, and he spent the next decade languishing in jail until the case went to trial in 2020. His defense attorneys argued that he was medically incapable of committing the crime due to his injuries from being shot months earlier. They also accused the police of carrying out a faulty investigation, which they described as nothing short of a nightmare. The first trial ended in a mistrial, and the case dragged on for three more years. In 2023, more than 12 years after the shooting, a second jury found Keatley guilty of two counts of murder and four counts of attempted murder. He was sentenced to six concurrent life terms without the chance of parole, and he reportedly plans to appeal his case. Number 6. Soul Subway Slaying 
While working for the Seoul Metro system in South Korea's capital in 2019, John Ju Hwan expressed an interest in a 28-year-old female co-worker. The woman rejected his advances, but he refused to take no for an answer. Instead of respectfully backing off, Jian persisted in his attempts to woo his colleague, calling her more than 300 times and begging her to date him. When she continued to turn him down, the crazed admirer threatened to hurt himself. Over time, John's behavior escalated from annoying to terrifying as his stalking campaign became increasingly aggressive. He even installed a hidden camera in a workplace bathroom and threatened to blackmail his co-worker with the videos he captured. After dealing with the unwanted advances for two years, the victim reported John to the police in 2021. She filed a second complaint a few months later. Authorities charged John with stalking, illegal filming, and threatening, and he was fired from his job. Prosecutors attempted to detain Jian pending the outcome of his case, but they failed to obtain the court's approval to hold him in custody due to his low risk of fleeing. No order of protection was issued for the victim, who was essentially left to deal with the situation on her own as Jian continued to terrorize her. After being convicted in connection with the woman's first complaint and sentenced to nine years in prison, Jian appealed his case. He remained free even as he continued to harass and intimidate the victim, including with demands to settle his criminal case in a way that was favorable to him. On the day before Jian was scheduled to be resentenced, he hid inside the employee bathroom wearing a swim cap and rubber gloves and waited for his co-worker to enter. He brutally stabbed a woman to death at the end of her shift, sparking widespread public outrage over the missed opportunities to prevent the tragedy from happening in the first place. John admitted that he killed his victim as an act of revenge for getting him in trouble with the law. When the woman refused to settle his criminal case, he became intent on murdering her. The obsessed killer was convicted of murder. Prosecutors pushed for the death penalty, but the court sentenced Gian to 40 years in prison, followed by 15 years on an ankle monitor. The woman's murder happened right around the same time South Korea implemented a new anti-stalking law, and yet the policy failed to protect her. In response to nationwide protests, the country's president, Yoon suk yeol ordered the Justice Ministry to improve the legislation. Lawmakers removed a clause that previously banned authorities from prosecuting suspects without a victim's consent, which arguably put victims at risk of retaliation from the accused. Stalking suspects are also now required to wear an ankle monitor even before sentencing. These long overdue changes came amid a years-long battle to improve legal protections for victims of gender-based violence in South Korea. And while many activists continue to campaign for additional improvements, the heightened policies mark a major step in the right direction toward keeping victims safe and holding perpetrators accountable. Number 5. Jake Balotta when 22-year-old Jake Bellotta's PlayStation disappeared in 2018, he suspected his former roommate, 24-year-old Joshua Barnes, of stealing the console. Barnes had recently been evicted from their apartment in Maitland, Florida for not paying his rent, and Bellotta believed that his ex-roomie had broken back into the unit and stolen the video game system, along with a bong and a marijuana scale. A third roommate, Ian McClurg, would later tell investigators that Bellotta was beyond pissed about the alleged theft and that he had punched a hole in the wall during a fit of rage. Bellotta's anger only grew when he heard that Barnes was supposedly bragging to people about stealing the PlayStation. In addition to being outraged, Bellotta was worried that the talk would inspire others to burglarize his apartment. Intent on getting his PlayStation back, Bellotta devised a plan to lure Barnes to the residence. He invited his former roommate to a made-up event, promising that there would be women there. When Barnes arrived at the apartment, Bellotta stabbed him to death in a frenzied knife attack while McClurg watched. Bellotta and McClurg planned to wrap Barnes's body in garbage bags and remove it from the apartment. But their new roommate unexpectedly arrived home and dialed 911 after discovering the carnage inside. During the call, the roommate told the emergency dispatcher that there was a history of problems between the suspects and the victim, but that he didn't know exactly what had happened because he had just walked in the door. When the dispatcher asked the young man how he knew Barnes was dead, he said that the victim was laying on top of a plastic bag and not moving. 
He also said that he was afraid that the suspects would do something to harm him and his girlfriend since they were aware of the crime. Thankfully, officers apprehended Balata and McClurg before anyone else could get hurt. Balata claimed that he killed Barnes in self-defense, but his story didn't hold up in court. He was convicted of murder and was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. McClurg pleaded guilty to accessory after the fact and tampering with evidence and received a 10-year prison sentence. Number 4. Gruesome Gangland Execution Residents in New York City's East Harlem neighborhood were sent running for cover one evening in April of 2023 when a young man was shot in the head at the intersection of East 123rd Street and Lexington Avenue. A local hairdresser named Sokna later told the New York Daily News that she heard around four shots. The moment the gunfire broke out, she and other terrified civilians took shelter in the back of her hair salon, where they prayed that no stray bullets would pierce the storefront's glass entrance and strike them in their path. Paramedics rushed the victim, 26-year-old Hector Delgado, to the hospital, but it was too late to save him. Members of the community were left shaken and exasperated by the violence, which some said happens too often. Police arrested the accused shooter, 23-year-old Trevor Gibbs, three weeks later. According to prosecutors, Gibbs murdered Delgado as revenge for the point-blank execution three days earlier of 19-year-old Jalen Duncan. The slayings came amid an ongoing feud between gangs, and investigators believe that Delgado's murder was also linked to the drug trade. Gibbs faces one murder count along with a weapons charge. Five more suspects were charged in connection with the crime, including 24-year-old Andre Clark, who faces a murder charge, 20-year-old James Figueroa, 21-year-old Ethaniel Coleman, and 25-year-old Ibrahim Ndaya were each charged with one count of attempted murder. All five of the men and a sixth suspect, 21-year-old Kevin Major, were hit with conspiracy charges. They're being held without bail at Rikers Island while they await the next steps in their cases. Number 3. Robert Manor and Victor Gray In January 2018, 55-year-old Raymond Wright vanished without a trace from his workplace in Rockland, California. He was never seen again. Two days after Wright's disappearance, his brother encountered a strange man inside Wright's home. The man fled the scene, leaving behind a drinking cup. About a week after that, Wright's abandoned truck was found, but the missing man himself was nowhere to be found. Five days later, a man named Victor Gray led police on a chase while intoxicated behind the wheel. When law enforcement caught up with him, they found evidence in his vehicle that they later connected to Wright's case, including a bloody raincoat, Wright's wallet, and several other belongings of his. Meanwhile, a DNA hit from the drinking cup that was left behind at Wright's house turned up as a match to Gray. Investigators also discovered a letter from Gray to a man named Robert Manor, complaining about not receiving a payment for what sounded like a hired hit on Wright. Seven years earlier, Wright had crashed his vehicle drunk, causing serious injuries to Robert Manor and his wife. Wright served prison time for the accident, but his mysterious disappearance and the evidence connecting Manor to the case led detectives to believe that Manor never let go of his grudge against Wright for the crash. In a rare case of authorities pursuing a murder case without a body, prosecutors accused Manor of hiring Gray to murder Wright as revenge for the previous DUI crash. A jury convicted both men of first-degree murder, and they were each sentenced to life in prison without parole. Wright's body remains missing to this day. It's understandable that Manor was upset with Wright for the life-changing consequences of his decision to get behind the wheel drunk, but two wrongs don't make a right, and Manor's refusal to move on from the incident in a healthy and legal way only hurt him more in the end by taking away his freedom. Number 2. Marquis Goodwine During the pre-dawn hours one morning in July of 2023, 18-year-old Lovell Brown left his home in Sanford, Florida on foot with his mother and several other family members to go buy some snacks. Along their walk to a nearby Circle K convenience store, the family crossed paths with a group of three to four people who were heading in the opposite direction. According to Brown's mother, Parlett Ramsey, a man from the group approached her son and an altercation broke out between the young men. 
the fight quickly escalated to blows and then gunshots. In what can only be described as a mother's worst nightmare, Ramsey stood by helplessly as her son collapsed to the ground. A bystander performed CPR in a desperate attempt to revive the young man, but he died from his injuries. Authorities charged the alleged shooter, 18-year-old Marquis Goodwine, with Lovell's murder. Ramsey recognized the suspect as someone her son had gone to high school with. She told investigators that in the months leading up to Lovell's death, she had received phone calls from several of her incarcerated friends, warning her to move her son out of the area for his own safety. The concerned mother initially heeded the warnings and sent Lovell to stay with his sister in California. He moved back to Florida a few months later and tried to keep a low profile, but the threats continued. On the day before Lovell's murder, someone allegedly threw a heavy rock at Ramsey's residence. Just hours before the shooting, Lovell had received a text message from someone who disliked him, challenging him to go outside. He ignored the harassment and stayed at home until the snack run later that night. According to court documents, Goodwine's cousin told police that she tried to persuade him not to go out that evening because she suspected that he was in a gang and that something bad might happen. Others reported that Goodwine and Brown were entangled in a long-running feud and that Lovell had beaten up his killer in the past. Goodwine had recently served jail time in an unrelated case and the rivalry continued even after the two men were given some much-needed space from one another. Authorities believe that Goodwine killed Lovell in an act of revenge over their previous run-ins. The suspect is being held without bail as he awaits trial. Number 1. Josue Vasquez 18-year-old Alyssa Banks was a member of the National Honor Society and the senior class president at her high school in Largo, Maryland. She was looking forward to the next chapter in her life after graduating in 2016. While out on a date with her boyfriend, Deshaun Moore, during the early morning hours a few months later, Alyssa got out of the car to help her bow parallel park. It was just before 2 o'clock in the morning when a group of men approached the couple. A man later identified by law enforcement as 20-year-old Josue Vasquez allegedly opened the door of the car that Alyssa's boyfriend was driving and asked him where he was from. According to authorities, as soon as Moore mentioned that he was from Largo, one of the men opened fire on the couple. Moore survived, but Alyssa died from a gunshot wound to the head. The case went unsolved for two years. Finally, in 2018, Vasquez and two alleged accomplices, Thomas Jenkins and Daniel Butler, were charged with Alyssa's murder. Prosecutors accused Vasquez of shooting Alyssa to avenge the death of a friend who had been killed at a house party a year earlier. Even though neither Alyssa nor her boyfriend were at the house party or involved in the previous killing. Moore reportedly identified Vasquez as the gunman and a friend of the defendant also claimed that they had overheard him confessing to the crime. Vasquez's co-defendant, Thomas Jenkins, testified in court that on the night of the shooting, he and Vasquez were looking around for anyone who matched the description of someone who had been at the house party a year earlier. Jenkins admitted that he didn't recognize the victims and claimed that the gun he was carrying malfunctioned and didn't fire. Jenkins took a plea deal while the case against Vasquez went to trial. Vasquez's lawyers argued that two of the key witnesses in the case were unreliable. They also claimed that the witnesses' testimony was bought and paid for in exchange for leniency in their own criminal cases. Moreover, there were some alarming discrepancies between Moore's description of the shooter as a black man who was at least six feet tall and Vasquez, a Hispanic man who stands at just five feet seven inches tall. After considering the evidence, the jury acquitted Vasquez, marking an emotional victory for the defense and a heartbreaking disappointment for the victims' families. Thanks for watching. Would you rather be the target of someone else's revenge plot or have your own plot against someone else backfire? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe. See you next time. Bye.